National Endowment of the Arts, uh, jazz master, and uh, of course a, a renowned uh, jazz figure, uh, historical figure, and, and uh, someone we're just very proud to have here. Uh, a couple of thanks that we'd like to uh, deliver are to uh, Jonathan Bloom and Holly Wallace from the Polonius Monk Institute for uh, making, uh, uh, sharing some of Ron's time with us today. Um, so I have a hand for the Polonius Monk Institute. Thank you. Thank you. One of the benefits of having them in, in the city that we, we get to have uh, events like this. Um, among other things, Ryan Carter is, is uh, uh, thought of as being the, the most recorded bass player in history. I went to his website and he says he's, it says he's on over 2,000 recordings. I went to Wikipedia and it said he's on over 2,500 recordings, you know, so give or take four or 500 recordings, he's arguably the most recorded bass player in history. So, and I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> I don't think anybody else is, you know. And I'm sure he's got a lot of important things he wants to tell us today, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions you want to ask him, and uh, we have for a short period of time, so uh, let's just get things underway. I welcome Mr. Ron Carter. Thank you. 
Thank you.
more chairs out here if you want to uh, grab some chairs. Really? Uh, let's everybody turn our phone. Yeah. It's too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> Shit. So, my name is Ron Carter, and good afternoon. I'm here at the insistence, actually, of the Thronius Blanc Institute of Jazz. They insisted that I be here or my check would be postdated to 2012. <laughs> so, here I am. Um, I'm uh, their guest lecturer for the week. Uh, I have retired from the City College of New York where I was professor of music, distinguished professor of music emeritus. I retired there in 2005. And I'm now just making gigs. I've been to Europe seven times last year, Japan three times, and uh, New York for two weeks. It's nice to be here, and this is the time when all the questions you wanted to never ask but didn't find anybody, I'm that guy. <laughs> However, what always happens is, and I throw the flow open to questions, there's this big silence that lasts from 10 minutes past one to five minutes to two. And as I head toward the door, all those questions that should have been asked from 10 minutes to one, 10 minutes past one to five minutes to get thrown at me. Well, I don't answer any of those questions. So now it's the chance to get me for the next 45 minutes. I got one for you. Good count. Somebody else. Somebody else. See? I can't believe that there are all these 60 people here that there's no question that they think that they can comfortably ask me that I might not have an answer for, which is okay. Yes. Um, but you have to speak aloud so we can all hear the question. I want to know uh, what were some of the exercises or maybe some of the things you did when, uh, when you were younger to maybe uh, develop your ability to play, I guess, uh, I mean, well, bass lines when you're copying behind solos, like what were some of the techniques that you would do to just develop that concept of what you're playing? Uh, I mean, you mean techniques as in physical techniques or uh, techniques as in musical techniques? Musical. Well, I think the first thing I did was study harmony and theory to know what the name of the chord was and what notes were in that chord. Then I studied piano so I kind of see where these notes were located. Uh, I have a process that I teach my students now where I put some dots on the blackboard that represent the notes for each measure per chord. And their job is to connect the dots for these measures to make a bass line. Uh, my feeling is that there's so many choices uh, available to us if we know how to spell the chord and know where on the bass those notes are located. We'll have a great time. But most bass players don't take lessons. Now, they're the last guy in the band to have some help. And because they're the last guy in the band to have some help, both technically and musically, they had slowed down the production, the, the progress, the musical advancement of those bands, you know. So I would recommend that those band leaders find somebody to help out that bass player, whoever he is. If it tells you you don't need any help, then you've got to fire that guy, because he really needs help then. <laughs> Uh, but there's no magic to what your question is. It's a lot of work, a lot of terrible notes, a lot of great notes. But you have to be curious to find out what they are. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I wanted you to uh, talk about your concepts of time. Because I've been checking out this one record that you did with uh, Bill Frizzell and Paul Motion. And the way that, that the time feels on this trio record is just... It's so loose. I'm not sure they can all, all hear you praise me. Can you talk a little louder? Yes, yes. Just how like loose it felt, yet so, so together at the same time. And I wonder like, if you wanted to expound upon your ideas of time and how working with different drummers makes you feel time in different ways. I That's guess. a couple of questions. If I answer the, answer the last one first. Okay. Uh, every drummer tunes his drums differently. And I think as they tune their drums differently is my job to find where between these differently tuned drums can I find my notes so they won't be wiped out by the tom-tom with a mallet or the bass drum hit with a loud pedal with no padding on it or a cymbal whose ring is like E flat against my open D. Mm -hmm. Those are real factors that I'm pretty much aware of and, and drummers who I work with who are also aware of those pitch factors of the drums mm -hmm make playing uh, music really easy for me. 
uh, as far as time is concerned, it's, it's kind of difficult because that changes with the groups. It changes with the kind of music. If they're uh, rhythmically curious or rhythmically uh, conservative, my job is to find somewhere in there where I can do both times and not lose me. Uh, if it will be uh, the person who shoots that guy with the telephone still on, <laughs> <laughs> If, if you will just stand here from, or sit there, and, and if you would just clap your hands and ask you to do that, we'll play something together, and I'll show you some things that I try to do that makes music playing fun for me. Okay. Can you do that? Sure. Okay. That's why I say it. I say it. Just clap like this. No matter what I do, don't just stand. You don't need any help. Are you a musician? We'll find out. but that's kind of the only way I can answer that, you know. It helps to have some talent. It helps to have a skill level on your instrument. It helps knowing songs, knowing tunes. I don't mean originals. I mean a, 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 a standard jazz library, for example. And it helps probably most of all being professional. That means being willing to make that person sound good enough they will call you when they return back to that city to ask to hire you. Um, there's no question that ego is important, but you've got to get a perspective of where it belongs and working all these various jobs. And, and the more experience you can have working with different people and trying to meet their demands musically, you better find, find a job somewhere. <coughs> and that's really, that's an easy question. <laughs> you know? Because that's what it takes to be a good Simon in New York. If you want to work in New York, you got to be able to play with anyone who calls you and be able to make their music sound as if, one, you belong there. Two, you're not just passing through. And two, they couldn't play those notes without you helping them. If you can do those three things, you'll always work. I do. Except this week, I'm hanging out at the Monk Institute in New Orleans. <laughs> okay, another question, please. Yes? Um, the way that you were breaking up time with him earlier is... It seems like the group with you and Tony Williams was one of the first groups in jazz to kind of break it up from kind of the straight tipping. And can you talk about um, playing with him and when you first started to play together and started to you know, learn how to take risks? Well, the historians have that kind of view. I, we haven't gotten that far yet. I mean, I don't, I don't really spend time to figure out who's the first one to do that. Well, I, I mean, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. I, I just joined being one of the guys that can do that. That's okay for me, you know. 
Tony, as you may know, his early record was always rhythmically curious. Uh, while he could play like Max Roach, or like Philly Joe Jones, or like Roy Haynes, he still had a view that made it comfortable for him to understand the history of the drums and feel free, because he understood the history, to break from that history, which allowed him to put meters in strange places and downbeats that would not normally have been there according to this historical background. And uh, I've been curious a long time about not specifically how to adjust the beat, but the playing the instrument. You know, my influences were not bass players. My influences were J.J. Johnson, mm -hmm. who on the trombone learned how to play all those notes going only this far from the bell. Or Cecil Payne, who came along when there were five other major baritone saxophone players. You had Harry Carney with Duke's band, you had uh, Pepper Adams, you had uh, Jerry Mulligan, you know, you had uh, Serge Charloff in Boston, you had Leo Parker, really be about saxophone player. He found a way to make the, sax the, the baritone saxophone sound like Cecil Payne. And my first two concerns, if I have to call them concerns, was it possible for the bass, given what it is, to sound different than somebody else playing the bass? And is it possible to play the range of notes of the instrument without doing this all night? And so that's what I spent my time trying to do, as I, do as I did yesterday, you know. Uh, as far as the time feel, I think you just do that and hope somebody is able to help you out when you get lost. <laughs> <laughs> I got lost three times with that band, I guess, in five years. That's pretty good. <laughs> Two. Two times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Why did you choose the bass? Of all the instruments you could play, why did that instrument speak to your voice? Well, actually, you know, it, I was kind of, um, um, if I could find the right non-emotional word, I was kind of forced into that. I started out playing cello when I was 10 or 11. And I played really well. I was really a talented young African-American cellist. And I played cello until I got to my senior year in high school. So that's about seven years so far. And uh, I noticed that the high school that I was attending, they were having the opportunity to play these functions, a, a parent-teacher organization teas and little conventions. And uh, I was never invited to play. And I thought that I deserved, I played as good as those guys did. And uh, I noticed that the bass player was graduating in January of my senior year. So I said, well, if this guy graduates, if I'm the bass player, then he got to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, so as far as uh, networking and you know, getting your name out there, what was your method of networking with all uh, the guys that you played with so you like, make your name as big as it is now? Plan good every night thinking that tonight got to be better than last night. And tomorrow's has to be better than tonight. Uh, I've, I've made it a, a, an unconscious effort to be professional. I'm always at the gig one hour early. My instrument is always in good shape to play. I always have a spare set of strings. If I'm given music to learn for the gig, I always spend time to learn the music sent to me in the mail. I wear great clothes, and I'm a very nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Those are important issues now. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Happy Hello. Carnival. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you how you take care of your hands and your posture and just take care of your body. Um, for a very long time, I've had a trainer come to my home at 5.15 a.m. 5.15 a.m. 5.15 a.m. <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday if I'm in town for the past 30 years. Uh, I've had some injuries, and I fell off a chair with wheels on, it hurt my back, and had some surgery, you know, and uh, stuff, you know. It had nothing to do with playing the bass, though. Don't misunderstand me. So I've had this person come to my house for an hour, all these visits, to do some free weightlifting and some stretch exercises. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian, but I eat very little meat, and I eat very few desserts. 
I'm lactose intolerant, so I don't drink, I drink uh, non-fat milk. And I fell, in, I fell in love with the yogurt last year, you know. I, I haven't gotten to the broccoli yet. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite in that zone. Um, I smoke a pipe occasionally. I've never done drugs. I have two drinks a year, my birthday, which is May 4, and New Year's Eve. Um, how do I take care of my hands? It's, it's, it's a problem for us, not just bass players. I'll give you an example. Um, most jazz clubs have no dressing room. That means you come from your car, wherever it is, right to the stage. And, and uh, so that means you, there's no chance to physically <coughs> warm up on the instrument, you know. Uh, either playing scales or whatever it does to take the hands from being so cold from coming outside to this warm stage to be able to play tunes that are always like this, the first tune. Okay. Well, the guys in my band love me because the first tune will never be that fast. Uh, I've tried these hand exercises and all that, and I just never get that kind of discipline. I just trust that I've learned how to play the instrument well enough to learn how not to overplay it until my hands have gotten uh, warm from being outside or certainly uh, uh, flexible enough to be able to do what I think my ear hears. Then my problem is, is that the best note I just found? But that's for another story for another time. Uh, <clears throat> one of my other concerns is when I'm off for <coughs> uh, two months, whatever calluses I have, they just kind of fade away. You know, calluses come by just scraping the string all the time. You know, Guitar players have them, bass players get them really obviously, drummers have them here. And when I don't play, mine go away, you know, because the skin isn't irritated. So it takes two weeks or so for a callus to come back that makes me comfortable again. It's not any secret. I wish I could find a better way, but it's just part of the trial and error of either doing this all the time or taking a break. And I like taking the breaks now. I, I, I didn't work from a uh, week before Thanksgiving, until last week in Boston. It was great. I mean, I wasn't worried about the best notes. I wasn't worried about being on time. I wasn't worried about parking my car or I wore my house shoes all day. I mean, it was just great not to have that responsibility for as long as I could financially afford it and musically have that reprieve from that responsibility of maintaining this standard. You know? It's great. But I'm paying the price now by doing this now. Small price to pay. Don't do this. Yes. You play with so many, so many musicians. Please. Like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think? Who was the most interesting guitar player as a musician, beyond just being a great guitar player, but as a musician as a whole that you play with compositions and uh, improvising? I know you work with Jim Hall. <laughs> uh, two things. Well, please don't do that. That just, that just takes me to another level, man. I mean, I'll leave here in a heartbeat if I hear that again. Um, you know, it's a difficult question to answer because they all offer me something different. They all, they all offer me a different part of music to learn. But Jim Hall, it may be his sound. With uh, uh, Bill Frizzell, it may be his curiosity with these pedals and stuff. You know, with uh, Gene Burton Sr. it may be just a classical sound of the guitar. With Wes Montgomery, it may be his amazing inventions on the instrument. Uh, with, with, Kenny, with George Benson, it may be his speed. With Kenny Burrell, it may be his sound. So they all offer me a, a, a lesson in how best to get it done from their point of view. And my job is to make their point of view feel logical and feel okay for me. Uh, there's not one of those names I've mentioned who offers me more than the other guys do. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was, I mean, you can talk about your concept in the bass as far as um, mixing in playing linear, like straight up down the instrument, also with jumps, like octaves and tenths and stuff, and how to make it logical and connected and to make it a, the bass line melody in itself. Well, you know, I, I try to, I try to uh, avoid doing this stuff. You know, I think for me it's counterproductive. You know, I tell my students they've got to play like a spider and not like a rabbit. You know, and I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious when I say that to them because they will see musicians 
bass players who play that way. You know, so I haven't found a way that I'm really comfortable with to say that and have them not go out and smack those guys who play that way, you know. I'm trying to be careful of not giving them that kind of inspiration to do that, you know. My, my reason to them is that those persons who play in this fashion as you, they spend a lot of time learning how to do that and learning how to be successful at doing that, and they are. My response to that situation is if they had done it from my point of view to have gotten where they want to go a lot faster and with a lot less physical effort. You know, TV guys like this stuff, man. They want to see you really working at it, you know. And when I don't do that, they're not so thrilled at seeing me, you know. Well, I miss some shots, you know. Okay, I'm, I, can, I can live with that. Basic, to me, the bass is like this. Not so much like this, you know. I mean, there'll be, there'll be a time when you hear a note that's here somewhere, and you go for it. You may not make it, but you hear it somewhere down here. But I'm, a, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty much a, a, what I call a horizontal player as opposed to vertical. You know, and, and I'm still trying to make it work. Having a good time trying. Okay. So, yes. Um, I was going to say, um, like, when, in your moments when you feel like you're not in top form, or where you know it may be like you know you don't have your calluses, um, how do you still play solid? How do you still make the gig? Uh, uh, you know, in those moments where you may not be in top form. Well, I think that I haven't had one of those moments yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's the determination and the discipline to try to play as good as you can every night. And I don't accept an off night or not feeling good to play good. You know, one of the things I learned from that Miles Davis band was every night is a chance to play some great music. Why would we not take advantage of that? How could we let that go by? How could we not acknowledge being prepared for this very special moment or moments at this one night event or this set or this tune or this chorus or this speed or this key or these changes? Why would we not be open to accepting the possibility that this may really be it? So that's my attitude. I've never felt that, that uh, this night cannot be the night. And I've always treated that one, this is my last chance to get it right. And I think the creative and I got a chance to try to make it work, I'm okay with that too. But I've never felt that I was, uh, what, what phrase did you say? Top form. It below my top form. Yeah, I never felt that I'm below my top form, man. I can allow that kind of thought process, man. If I do, I have to, I have to stop playing. If I feel I can't do this job, I won't take it before I take it. I feel I can handle it. Yes? Um, I don't think I've ever heard you play electric, and you just were talking about jobs that you uh, accepted. To climb. How do you decide that? Well, I haven't played electric in about 30 years. Okay. Um, I made a couple of with, I played with McCoy on electric, one of his tracks on the seat on a, on a milestone record probably, and maybe one of the George Benson, Freddie Hubbard records, maybe Red Clay. So I've done some stuff. But I, I think that, you know, to maintain the kind of level that the guys who play electric bass really have, I couldn't play this as nearly well as I try to play it. And uh, I mean, it's really time consuming, as I know that that is. And in order to be competitive with that market, not those players, with that market. I can't possibly spend the time on upright anymore. That's why I don't play it. And there's some great players. I heard Victor Wooden last week, and I'm just amazed at what those guys can do. You know, but I know what it took to be able to get to do that. And I know I'm not willing to put that kind of time in and let that, let that sit in the corner and get cobwebs. I'm not willing to do that. Yes? Uh, can you talk about your approach to constructing bass lines and um, like if there's specific things that you practice or just concepts in general that you think about? Well, what I have my students do when we talk about building bass lines, I've written two books on the subject, published by Hal Leonard, <laughs> um, is that we try to stay in half position. Are you a bass player? Yeah. Can you know what half position is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Those who aren't, let me show you.
Half position is the first position on the base, which starts from here to here. And what I, what I have my students do is when we build lines, just play quarter notes, just play chord tones, and don't go past half position. until I feel they've learned what these choices are without moving, without adding any kind of rhythm, just quarter notes. And then maybe if they've gotten, finally gotten this point of view on the control, then I'll say, okay, add some rhythm, but don't lose where the beat happens to be. study along with these bass lines some skill levels, some techniques, some books on how to develop technique to play the instrument. I, I think that the more technique a bass player has to understand these positions from here on up, the more choice he has of playing a better bass line without running out of things to do. So given this is his fourth month with me of less than a week, he may have finally gotten up here on the bass as far as our exercise book is concerned. <laughs> And my job is to show them how to make these bass lines and incorporate this part of the bass with this part of the bass. So I may tell them, okay, for the first chorus, just stay up here. start to incorporate this part of the bass with this part of the bass. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, specifically, uh, what is the difference between present day students, music jazz students, uh, and actually like previous generations? Is there any differences in the learning or in the music? Well, you know, I don't see that many anymore, so it's a little difficult to use that kind of comparison. I will say, if, if I can relate to my music school as opposed to private students, I can do that for you. I think that there's so many other, other things for the student to do to take up his time, to, to make him have less idle time to fill up with practicing his instrument, you know, uh, that they seem to be a more difficult time for them maintaining or establishing a focus and discipline and when and how to practice. Uh, and I got pretty discouraged a couple of times when, when <coughs> I would give a student who was really talented an assignment to be done within a week, Monday to Monday. And he came in on Monday and it was ill-prepared. I was just kind of, I, I couldn't understand why it didn't seem important enough to him to get this lesson right, to help him play better. 
uh, ten years ago, I wouldn't have seen that. What society has to do with it, I'm not sure, but something. And I think there's so many things to do other than practice, and until they have determined that practicing is what it's going to take to play this better, it's going to be a, t it'd be a tough fight for those people, and a very discouraging one and disheartening one for their teachers. Okay, yeah? I wanted to ask, uh, what was it like to play like Joe Henderson with, with, as a musician? You know, I never know how to answer that question. I mean, I mean uh, what was it like to play with Joe Henderson? I, 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 I understand the question. I just haven't found out how to answer that, other than it was great. <laughs> Which seems like a pretty silly answer for an important question, you know. So if, if the best I can do is great, will you be offended? Okay, answer, ask me the question again. Uh, what was it like to uh, play with Joe Henderson? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, earlier you talked about the, uh, earlier when you talked about um, the actual pitch of the drummer cymbal yeah. and how that affects you. Uh, what about the actual the drummer's uh, technique on the ride cymbal, the jazz ride cymbal pattern? Well, you know, I, I still like tang, tang, a lang, tang, a lang, tang, a lang, tang, a lang. Anything else doesn't doesn't fit for me because I want to find out where between these beats this other other sound is, so I can find out where you think the tempo has to be. Uh, some drummers don't play the hi hat very loud, and and that kind of bothers me because I want to know where he feels the two and four belong in this measure. Where in this measure is two and where is four? Even if the hi hat is on all the downbeats. Well, if they do that, that's different. But I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm not talking about those guys. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I was with Tony Williams who kind of invented that pattern, so I'm okay with that view. My point was that guys who don't use it at all, and if a guy's going to do like this all night, he has to know where a beat is because he's beating it on every four beats. Uh, I, when I only hear the hi-hat, it's hard for me to tell where he thinks the meter is located. And if he does a single stroke on the right sample, it's hard for me to tell where and of the beat is. If I just hear one, two, three, four, I want to know where's and. So I'm playing on and sometimes. I told him my and is where his and is. You know. Sounds like a British guy. Hey, Harry, you know, give me an and here. Yes. <laughs> I was wondering uh, if you, if you think of breathing um, while you're playing at all. Absolutely. Uh, Baseline is like a story. It's like a sentence. And every sentence, assert, every word in the sentence has a value to that sentence. It's like when you're reading a run-on sentence in the book, if you don't have any drop in your voice, there's no punctuation, there's no commas, it goes like that. I try to play my bass lines with some kind of commas during the course of that line, whether it's a 12-bar blues or a 32-bar form or a 16, 16, whatever it is. I try to put some commas in that line so that I can do like this. And my bass line should reflect that slight comma to have the blind line have, have a line. It's a story. You know, I, I think that if you can hear a record and turn off everybody's track but the bass player's track, given it's not an original, you should be able to figure out what that tune is by the chances he plays and by the commas he makes in his bass line. I think I can do that pretty good. If he would stand here, you would, he would hear me kind of exhale for a bass line. Because I like to have this space that kind of gives me a capital letter here, uh, underline this word, and these commas, these breaths help that have a shape like that. Okay? Yes? Um, as like a learning jazz musician. As a what? Like, as like a learning jazz musician, like I've known that like from like different places, people have different types of swing. Like from here, people swing different from Florida. In Florida, people swing different than people in Japan. But it also happens within time. So my question is, as of from like your generation, how is our generation swing different than yours? Well, I think time has no generation. Mm -hmm. So when you say my generation, that, that kind of dates me. I know you don't mean to do that. Oh, no. And I'm not offended yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think if, if I have to tell a difference playing with a drummer from New Orleans and one from New York just to have two different locations, the New Orleans drummers play more like a street beat. They're more like on one. You're on one, they're on two, they're on three, they're on four with some rolls in between. Now, the New York guys play like this. They're on the end of one, maybe the end of two, they'll hit three, maybe they hit the end of four. That kind of 
apparently a seemingly irregular location of one with these anticipations of what the New York dramas feel like to me. And my job is to make it sound like they're all the same. <coughs> yes? How do you, uh, how would you deal with, like, when you, when you play, it is so precise and specific, so how can a student work on the uncertainty of improvisation but maintain that sound of precision? Well, I think he has to understand three really basic things. One, he has to know the melody. Two, he has to know the changes to the tune. And three, he has to know the form of the song. If you can't do those three things, you have no chance of playing this tune in any shape, form, or fashion. You have to understand what the melody is. What are these chords that you should know do to this melody? And where in the form is this melody happening? Is there a first ending? Is there a second ending? Is there 16 and 16? Where does the bridge go? What's the chord you use to go back from the last part of the tune back to the top? This kind of, kind of uh, math information. You know, music is actually mathematics and manual dexterity. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So this is the math part of the music. The math of what's the melody. The math of what's the form of this song. The math of how many, how many bars in this form. Is it eight, 16? Is it 8? Is it 12? I think once the student has an informational sense of those factors, it will be easier for him to kind of clean up his line and play a little more specifically because he has this information at hand. It's not, it's not a guess. I think this is letter A. This might be letter B, but I'm not sure what the chord is. Well, I mean, you can't play like that. You've got to know this is a C7, this is the downbeat of the bridge. Bam. Otherwise, playing clean is not possible for you. Articulate clean. If somebody else has a question, don't go away. Somebody else? Yes? Do you um, incorporate singing? Don't go away, though. Do I what? Incorporate singing in your practicing? No. <laughs> singing. It's hard to talk when I'm playing, man, let alone singing. I admire people who do that. Jay, Lynn, Jay Leonard does that, and Christine Cope. The people who do that, but I can't do that. Not, not in your playing, but just when you're practicing. No. To get your ear. No. I hear already. I don't need that kind of thing. <laughs> I can't sing it now, man. My, my, only, my only time, the only time Miles spoke to me, we were doing this song, Autumn Leaves. And the last chord of the tune is the G minor. You know? And I played the, the fourth beat of the last bar of that tune, I played the B natural going to see the top of the tune. And he came by after he heard that note and said, what's that note? All I could think was B. <laughs> I couldn't say it was the third of the chord. I couldn't say it was going to the C. It was a, I couldn't think of anything but B. That's my, my complete library of words spoken to him in five years on the bandstand while playing the bass. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yes. Um, um, noticing as like all the CDs that you've been on, like you have like this um, this, rela this relaxation about you, like you're really relaxed. So like, um, what do you do to maintain relaxation? I like, say like um, when you were younger and some like big cat offers you like a gig, like what keeps you relaxed and lets you, what what makes you um, portray your own sound? Although you're, you got like all these, um, you're very tense about everything else. What keeps you relaxed? Remind me not to ask you anything else. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty calm and casual person, you know, uh, to kind of go backwards to your question. Um, and I have been asked by some big name cats to join their bands. And I felt okay. I felt that I was supposed to be there if you asked me. I never felt tense, you know. Um, someone often asked me what I said when Miles asked me to join his band. Was I excited? And, and uh, did I feel I had made it? Did I feel I was on my way to being wherever those people are who played in his band? Did I ever feel like that, you know? I told them, no, I didn't feel like that. I just felt that I had a job already, first of all. I was working. I was not unemployed. I had eaten breakfast and lunch that day. 
<laughs> and I had paid my La Connet bill for the month. So joining him was not that kind of boost for me. I was working with Art Farmer, Jim Hall, and Walter Perkins at a place called The Half Note. It's a great band. I was learning songs every night. I was learning new tunes, new keys. I was having a great time with these guys. So for Miles to come after me, join this band, leave Namar, that was out of the question for me. So I said, look, if you ask Art Farmer, if he says okay, then we'll leave tomorrow. If he says not, I'm here till Sunday, and I'm okay with staying till Sunday. You know? So he asked Art Farmer, and the rest is kind of history. But I didn't get tensed up about that. I mean, I, I, I had a job. Man. I was not exactly a zero when he found me in the, the junk heap of musicians, so to speak. You know? <laughs> uh, I've always felt that if I was there, I was supposed to be there. I never felt that I was over my head. I never felt that I couldn't handle it. All I wanted was a chance to get, to get my shot. You know? uh, there may be things that make me get tense, have you defined that word, but they got nothing to do with music. They got to do with life. You know? I, I, I drove here from school and, and we passed the, some of the, uh, the markings on the homes for the, the, the Katrina. You know, I get intense. Yeah, I got. I, I was ready to go back to the hotel. Okay, that's that's where I was with that. But that's what I do, man. That's what I do. Those are my house shoes. That's my garage. That's my trash can. That's what I do. I don't, I don't worry about that. I do the best I can, and the creator's good to me. Yes? Um, as a teacher, have you had students that you thought were amazingly talented and well-prepared and worked hard that would have issues with performance anxiety? And if so, how did you help them get through that? I have no students like that. you never had a student? No. No. If they follow what I do, they won't get that. And I say that not to, not to kind of short circuit your question, but I'm a good example of how not to let that do you. I think those people who have this performance anxiety, I think one of the processes they go through, as I understand it, is to follow someone around and watch how they prepare for performance. If they can see me doing this, whether it's coming to a rehearsal or at a record date with no, re with no rehearsal, or get into the gig, serving the music on the bandstand, if they can see me go through these processes and kind of follow my lead, they will be a lot less inclined to have this performance anxiety. Uh, but none of my students have that, have, to my knowledge, have had that as part of their performance history. Um, I, know it's not a comf I know it's a tough thing to have to overcome. A and uh, I'm not the kind of person who would play a psychiatrist and have answers to, as to why it happened. All I could tell them, if they happen to have this situation, hang out with the day with me. Just spend the day, me and you, and just watch what I do, and see how it affects your view of performance, for example. I mean, see me walk five blocks from my car to the gig, cold and rain, go right to work and play as best I can. My anxiety is why I get a ticket parked at Huang Park, not about the base. <laughs> and in New York, they're very, in New York, they're very expensive. No, I, I, don't, I don't know. That's why I can answer that. I, I just don't have that fear, I guess you'd call it. But I would tell them if they experience that, let's spend a day. Are you into that zone? Pardon? Are you into that? You, you, you know somebody who has that form of anxiety? Yeah. Your students, some of your students do? Really? With performance is their best level on the Really? Well, I, can't, I, I, I was filled the pipe, pipe and have them all trucking behind me as I make go to this gig tomorrow night. <laughs> I'll have to do it if I can't do that instead. Yes? Um, Mr. Carter, I absolutely love your bow work. Yes, I love it. Uh, what's your advice for, for jazz players in, in using the arco, using the bow? Give the teacher. That's the only way they're going to learn how to do it correctly correctly, broadly as opposed to incorrectly. Uh, jazz players are known for improvising and making things work through some strange circumstances, either through uh, ignorance or poor tools or lack of study. If you get a teacher, man, it'll save them a lot of work trying to get a quality sound. What's the right bow for them? What's the right weight? Do you want 
horse hair, you want nylon hair, you want bleached hair, you want unbleached hair, what kind of rosin you want to use. You want, but there's so many factors to make it really work for them and eliminate some of the trial and error that they will go through without this kind of well-informed outside force. Awesome. Yes? Uh, you talked in detail about your sound in relationship to the drums. Can you talk about the same thing but in, the, in relation to um, guitar players or keyboard players, like when basically when another amplifier enters the equation and if you've had any obstacles with uh, if that, how that affects your sound and how you deal with it? Well, uh, when you play with musicians whose first thought is to make good music, the problem that you imply of, of, of uh, amplified, other instruments being amplified doesn't really occur. And if that amplifying problem is on the horizon, and it's getting to be a problem, if I'm one of the parties involved, I really don't mind telling this person, can he turn down so we can both have fun playing this gig? Uh, one of my stories with Russell Malone, who's a fabulous guitar player, was we did this gig at the Village Vanguard. And Russell was sitting as I am now, he had his amp in front of him. And it was really, it was really loud. But for him, it felt okay because he was not in front of the amp. He's getting the sound from the back of the club in the back. You know? So I asked him, I said, Russell, can you turn your amp down from stun to quiet? <laughs> <laughs> and he understood, it, it got done, you know. Uh, Again, when you play with quality players who want to make the band and make this group music, they're open to any suggestions that make this possible, up to and including turn the amp down. And I don't mind asking for that. I will not always get it. <laughs> and I will, I, I will not always be there to get it either. But most musicians, I mean, they're, they're people, man. They want to play some music. They're not into, they're not into this you know, uh, stacks and stacks of whatever they use. They're not, they're not, they're not, uh, have no interest in doing it. They just want to make a nice musical quality to go home with. And wherever it takes to make that happen, down the, down the bandwagon. Yes? Do you ever get tired of music? It's a pretty broad word, music. What do you mean, music? I mean, like, all music, just music in general. If you ever, if you ever just don't want to listen to music, um, not really. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I do take a break from making gigs, from playing music. That's a little more complicated than just listening. But I, I, I have never gotten to the stage, I think, that I'm aware of that I just got so disgusted with music I wouldn't, I wouldn't listen to any music. I mean, I just can't do that. I just don't see how that's really possible given our society unless you just go into a closet and don't come out for a week. <laughs> There's music all around us, man. Whether, whether it's the, the ice cream man with the truck on the streets or the television or the theaters or the radio, how can you not have any music in your house, in, in your environment, wherever that is? You know, I mean, uh, that's a nice philosophical question, but I think it's pretty irrational to make that question out loud. I'd say that to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I want, let's my spouse over here for a minute. Yes. Uh, Look at Matt. You've made it clear that you, you're, you're very sensitive to the, how things actually, the sound of things. And I'm wondering, since you've been in the studio so often, if you have preferences for how your instrument's recorded or if you help engineers get the sound that you want in the finished product. And then another kind of tangent to that is, are you a person that wears full headphones in the studio, or do you just wear one headphone, or do you hate headphones entirely? Or? What I try to do is have the engineer come out to the room to hear what the bass sounds like. I said, this is what, this is what my bass sounds like, right here, right now. And what can I do to help you make this bass sound like it does right now on this CD that comes out a year from now? And we can remember the following things. From the time I play this note, until it gets to your house, there are four people who affect this sound. The engineer, who is of course recording it. <coughs> the producer, who has his own view of what the sound should sound like. The guy who cuts the disc, and the guy who makes the master. Now they all affect what this sounds like. So it's actually not much I can do once I play the first note. 
I just hope that this engineer has gotten a substantial representation of what this sounds like. So when it goes through all these other stages of production to your house, there's not a lot to be lost on the floor, so to speak. And I'm happy to say that through all these recordings, I've been able to have my sound be as constant as I have, you know. Um, do I wear earphones? have a microphone in front, sometimes they don't. But I tell them I bring my own sound from my house. Let's just do that. Um, again, you know, I'm always amazed that, that uh, given all these reproductive factors from the time I play this note to your CD player, most bass player sounds are able to stay the same given all these factors that are between here and here for you. Okay? Thank you. Yes? Um, your left hand is very strong. Uh, well, it seems like you get a lot of sound, like when you were playing earlier, you did a lot of stuff, wool offs and stuff. Um, to get all that together, do you tell your students, um, is there a classical element to, to what you teach? Is, is, is there a what? Classical music, as far as classical techniques or classical music that you would tell a kid some of your students to study? Um, we study classical etudes. I want them to develop skill levels. I want them to develop technique. I want them to know this note is B flat. This note is C. This note is D flat. This is D. This is G. I want them to know the instrument. And how they use this skill level is up to them. Uh, I don't try to make them change their notes. I try to find a, an increase in skill level that helps them find those notes easier. Now, I don't encourage them to play like me, but that's not a bad idea either. You know, I try, I try to have them develop a, a skill that their ear hears based on the technique I'm helping them develop. If they can develop this technique by use of this exercise on page 25 in this particular book we can use, great. Yes? You put a lot of weight on getting a private instructor. Yes. Um, who was your favorite private instructor that influenced you the most? Oscar Zimmerman at the Eastman School of Music, 1955 to 1959. And the second important teacher was Robert Bernan, who was in the Philharmonic January... 1960 to June 1961 when I got a master's. Great, great teachers. I want to be one of those. I want to be a great teacher. Yes? Um, who are you checking out these days, listening to, and what excites you? It's um, new. Um, well, last week I was listening to uh, Glenn Gould and the Goldberg Variations. That excites me. And... Uh, I listened to, a, I did a recording on a Bach Brandenburg with an orchestra in New York. That excites me still. Uh, I listened to uh, the meters, and they excite me. You know, I listened to uh, uh, the Vorjak New World Symphony. That melody is a killing. I mean, I wish I could, that the melody is fabulous, man. If I, if I recorded that melody with Houston Person and Bill Frizzell on a record called the Orpheus, the Brazilian record, and I took the melody from that going home for Houston to play a melody. So that kind of stuff for the past week or so. I can turn it off in my ear, but it's, it's around. You know. Okay, yes? Do you have a personal preference as to your physical placement in any given setting? Like, Left to right with the drum kit. <coughs> for, I prefer between the piano and drums with the stick on the piano and the half stick. And right there, because the stick is, is it, the opening is this big, the sound is bouncing out right from this angle right here. When you have a good piano player and a good piano, it is so loud. You know, the Bechstein is a loud piano. The Fazioli, they are loud pianos. So when I play with Chick Corea or Gonzalo Rubacaba or Herbie Hancock who play those pianos, so I'm either half stick or no stick. But it cannot be a full stick. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm prepared right there with that on the half stick. Yes? Talk about when you played with Monk. Uh, uh, Sam Jones was a 
as was a friend of mine, he's no longer with us, and uh, he called me one day saying that he was sick with the flu, and he had a job with Thelonious Monk at this place called The Circle in the Square, which is a, a theater in a round in New York on Thompson and Bleecker back in 1960. Yes, 1960. <laughs> and he said, can you make this job for me? I said, yeah, I'm off for the night. So I went to, this, to the club and met Mr. Thelonious Monk, and, Charlie Rouse, and I think uh, Arthur Taylor was playing drums this night, and uh, he said, uh, I said, Mr. 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 Monk, my name is Ron Carter, and I'm suffering for Sam Jones tonight. And he said, thank you, do you know my songs? I said, well, I think I do. He said, well, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> we finished the gig, and he said, I'm going to, Mr. Thonia said, I'm going to Philadelphia tomorrow. I have a week in Philadelphia with a matinee on Monday and a matinee on Saturday, and went tonight, are you available? I said, yeah. So we meet at the hotel house at two o'clock. So went to Philadelphia for a week. However, I was going to Manhattan at the same time. So we would drive to Philadelphia. We do the gig from nine to one. We get in the car, drive two hours back to Manhattan, getting me home about three thirty. I'm up at seven thirty for eight o'clock theory class. Ten o'clock orchestra lesson. At two o'clock harmony class. I meet Thelonious Monk at my house at 7 o'clock, going back to Philadelphia for the second night, just for a whole week. <laughs> wow. That's why I'm cool. That's why I'm relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, there are many differences to playing in the studio and performing live. I was just wondering, which one do you prefer and why? Studio or live? They're so different. It's kind of hard to say I prefer either one. They all offer different things. Yeah. There's some good studios in New York. There's some good small clubs in New York that make me feel that I should be there more often. And, and, uh, but they all offer their advantages and disadvantages. I'm trying to adjust to which one I can adjust to the quickest. Depends on the fact of who's, what the band is, what the music, how the piano is, all those factors, man. I like them all. Yes? Uh, I have two questions. Um, one, do you ever play the, um, like the electric upright no. kind of, oh, okay. No. And uh, the other question is, um, how do you feel about people sampling your music, like uh, hip hop producers and things like that, when they um, kind of you know sample music and, like, like and remix it into something else? Um, I have a couple of different responses to that. One is, of course, I'd like to have my music played wherever it can, and clearly they have a pretty big audience, you know. And I also like to get paid for it, and that the day it's sampled illegally is, is a drag. Um, I would not like it to be associated with some of the lyrics I hear. So if I had my druthers, I would like to have control over what the lyrics are that are being used on the track that they're sampling my bass on in the ideal world. I haven't had that connection with those people, and they just sampled and I got paid, but I, I'm not sure I, I didn't really... I wasn't really flipping over because I thought that, man, those lyrics are, jeez. Uh, as as a, um, a hip hop producer, I, well, I, I no, feel you're the guy I'm going to talk about. <laughs> 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 but I can relate because I, I had that happen to me with one of my beats that I made back in 2000. Somebody took it, and when I heard the song, I was like, oh, man, I didn't even want to hear it past the first song. Yeah. But when they put the money in my hand, you know, I was like, oh, well, at least I. But I, wasn't, I wasn't quite there. I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't there that second part. You know, uh, yeah, you, you know, uh, when I made this record with um, Trap Call Quest, you know, called it Low End Theory, when we finally got the schedule worked out and, and I kind of agreed to do it, I let them know before I left my house, I said, look, if there are any drugs here or any lyrics I don't like, I'm going home. And I said, you mean that? I said, yeah, man. He said, why? I said, because my plan on your record means I endorse that, that, that uh, those words, those lyrics. It means I'm okay with that. Well, <coughs> from what I hear so far, I can't be okay with that stuff. So if they're going that way, I'll know they are, and I'll just be said, I'll be gone. I will leave. My motor's still running until for another half hour, the meter's, the meter's still clicking, and I'll be gone in a heartbeat, man. Well, I said, hey, look. We can't discuss that. There's not an option. And it came out and made a very nice record. One of the greatest. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. 
Got two more questions in the staff of my milk and cookies for my nap. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to like the, the record store these days in the jazz like area, there's everything from like Satchmo to like electronica and stuff like that. Do you think there's any like a uh, I guess philosophical differences in the approach to creating music now than there was back then? Or I, I where do you see it going? Yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure where it's going, but I, I think the electronic gear that's available is made guys who weren't very good sound a lot better. <laughs> you know, and, and it makes guys who can't get a deal able to make their own music for, for sale and publication. Uh, do I know where it's going? No, and I hope that I get the address before everybody else does. <laughs> okay? Thanks. Two more. Yes? Can you talk about chops versus groove and or pockets? Um, well, chops generally means for me guys who have a great level of skill. I mean, they can go all over the bass like it's going out of style. You know, the strings end up by having steam coming off. They're going so fast, you know. Well, that's not what I do. I can do it. But I think my intent when I play the bass is to have whoever's playing with me not play against me. You know? I tell them I'm on this magic carpet, let's go for this ride. You know? And I'm pretty confident that my place of where I place the beat is where it belongs. And if I find the right notes to go with my beat, I got them by the throat, brother. They are mine. Uh, when you find that zone, when you find that pocket, when you find that slot, with the right time and the right set of notes, you own those guys, man. And until bass players understand that, they always be playing chops. They don't understand how much control they have of a band. I understand that. And people in my age group generally do, after all those years. They understand who's responsible for what's going on. So, uh, Chops are what they are, and you can buy them at the grocery store for four dollars a pound. <laughs> but <laughs> groove and, and, and pocket is something completely different. And if you find the right notes to go with your time, you own those guys. Okay, two more. <coughs> yes? Your sensitivity to sound, um, how did you go about developing it, and um, how did you um, work on keep making the relationship strong and personal? Well, you know, once I decided what I thought the bass could sound like for me, I would work toward remembering what it felt like physically and where my hands were and how the bass was set up at that time and, and, and at, at that time to be able to reproduce that setting. So much so that I got to the point where my bass was always set up like that. And I always had these strings on it. It was always the, 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 the sound was in the right place that I could get this sound at will. Then my job became to be not taking the bass out of the case unless I could be sure of hearing that sound. Or not playing a chorus and not being disappointed because I didn't get the sound I got from the chorus that I liked before. <coughs> I think it's that, that discipline and, and that, that determination and that honest self-critiquing of what you do that makes it possible for you to maintain that sound quality in this case forever. You know, sometimes we don't really say how bad we sound for whatever reason. You know, it doesn't, I don't want, I don't want to beat myself up, or my ego is whatever it is, and that's, it's okay. I got another chance at it. I, I'm not in that zone. You know, uh, for me, a recording session is like going again, going to school free. I say, well, gee, the F sharp is on this note, on this bass that it didn't come out. Why didn't it come out? or the E string is not the same quality as the G string. It's a good note, but the sound is not right. You know? And when I would take the case out, the bass off this case, that's my view. Can I make this bass have the same sound, the same sound that I had when I put it away the last time? I think it's this level of determination and memory and distance and self-critiquing, honestly, that has allowed me to be able to maintain that kind of standard with the instrument. Yes? Um, do you play any other instruments? Um, and if so, how do you think it uh, impacts your bass playing? 
I play enough piano to not get hurt, and nothing else affects my bass playing. Yes? You've done a, a fair amount of uh, Brazilian recordings and, and other things like that. How do, you find a, how do you find a good balance between respecting another culture and learning about their music and also keeping like a part of your American identity in the music without, you know, how, how do you respect it and get into it but uh, also keep your own personality in it? Well, I, I think if you have a, a strong enough personality and a real personal point of view that's in place already, mm -hmm. You don't just shed that and put it in a drawer and go try something else. Right. You know, uh, I've always wanted to to uh, be able to to take off for a month or so and go down to Brazil and just find out as an ethnomusicologist what it is about that music that makes it seem so natural for me to play it. You know, uh, right now my Brazilian records are the standards that bass players use to play Brazilian music. You know, that's really, really far out, man. If you think that this guy in New York, living in Harlem, man, he's, he's the guy who the Brazilian bass players imitate. That's pretty, pretty strange, actually. <laughs> so I, I want to go down there at some point to say, well, what's the, what is, is there a, a connection based on my heritage? Is, is there a bloodline? I, I don't know those facts, you know. Uh, I can only think that whatever the Brazilian music is, however it's defined, it's close enough to what I already do. The only thing I do is slide this much, and I'm in, I'm in that Brazilian zone. And when I'm at New York, I'm back to the New York again. So I could explain it to you in a not too heavy explanation. Okay, two more than the top of my nap. Yes? Um, it seems as though most bass player's career is the majority as a side man. I was wondering if you enjoy that more than you do as being like in your own group as a leader or vice versa. It depends on a lot, there are a lot of factors. Uh, I, I don't do much side man work anymore because promoters, if they see that, they think I'm not serious about being a band leader and I can't get my price for the band leader. You know? uh, and I like not being a band leader because I'm not responsible for the sets, the gigs, the money, the hotel, none of that stuff. So it depends on uh, who I am in my head at the time. So. That's his last question. This is now 2.16. My nap time is at 2.30. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope to see you soon.